Hello, and welcome back to the uh, Good Faith Cybersecurity Researchers Coalition's or GFCRC series of video conversations, panel discussions, and presentations about topics related to the protection of responsible cybersecurity vulnerability researchers and disclosure. This series of videos is designed to outline the challenges, the opportunities, the progress, and future plans of activities around legislative and legal protections for such researchers. Currently around the world, uh, a lot of jurisdictions face serious issues because there is unclarity or outright threat to the continued uh, safety and uh, ability to continue work of responsible researchers, whether academics or in industry or individuals, because of op opaqueness and unclear and inconsistent legal protections or even outright laws which, which uh, criminalize such behavior. The GFCRC is a not-for-profit industry initiative that is dedicated to supporting the recommendations of the OECD of or the Organization for Economic Cooperation Development on the development of consistent legal uh, and policy protections for such researchers. As part of this series, I talk with a number of stakeholders, people who've had experience with the legal system in various ways, researchers who have a lot of experience with technology, with finding bugs, with, with, with communicating bugs bug bounty platforms, and, and other aspects around the disclosure of vulnerabilities in a responsible, consistent, and predictable manner. Uh, that is something that obviously industry is very dependent on in order to be able to continue working in a reliable manner, in a secure manner, uh, and in turn society is dependent on in order to be able to be assured that it can be quickly and uh, effectively protected from upcoming bugs and vulnerabilities in the cybersecurity space. So Edward Ferrell is Director of Mercury uh, Services, Internet Services, sorry, you're going to correct me on that, in Sydney, Australia. He's a highly experienced security researcher. He's uh, got a lot of defense and uh, geopolitical uh, cybersecurity experience as well. He's a well-known face on the Australian cybersecurity conference circuit. He's a, he's a frequent lecturer looking at his LinkedIn profile uh, and a, a publicly visible figure in the area and uh, somebody who has uh, some hands-on experience with legal issues surrounding bug and vulnerability disclosure. So without me you know, mangling your background any further, I'd like to give you the opportunity to quickly present yourself, who you are, where you come from, what you do, and then we'll jump right in. Excellent. So uh, just to correct the, uh, the company name, it is Mercury Information Security Services. Everyone gets that. it wrong. Now, I'll, link, I'll, I'll, link to you guys, I'll link to you guys in the video description, so we'll, we'll make sure we get that right. We just call ourselves Mercury, uh, so yeah, I'm, so I'd say it, it is a challenge, I'm aware of it, so we're just happy calling ourselves Mercury. Um, so uh, I did start Mercury eight years ago um, and uh, have since built it out uh, over that time. Uh, we're a, a sizable work pen testing firm here, uh, but uh, funnily enough, a lot of our work was, uh, I guess you'd say, associated during that 20 15, 2016, 2017 period where uh, I still had time on my hands to do things like vulnerability research. Uh, so it's been a, a really wonderful journey with a, a great company. And concurrent to that, uh, I also uh, am an industry fellow at the Australian Defence Force Academy, uh, where I've been uh, teaching since 2017. So, um, and prior to that, network engineering, done a bit of everything over the last 20 years. So it's been a, a very uh, a very good uh, career that I've had. Excellent. Thanks very much. So I think the the thing that really struck out to me when we were speaking earlier and you introduced yourself was when you mentioned your work on previous vulnerability research. Now, one of our recent videos was with Inti de Coicolaire in Belgium, which if you haven't had a chance, please do have a look at that. It's, it's linked in the description as well. Um, who got in trouble for, uh, I think, specious reasons um, under a, at the time, again, inconsistent, unclear, restrictive set of rules regarding vulnerability research when he attempted to disclose a vulnerability in a responsible and and, and reasonable manner. You mentioned uh, work on on some systems areas that, that, you know, led you to, let's say, <laughs> encounter some, 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 some issues in that regard. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, definitely. So, uh, funnily enough, we were doing a reconnaissance and prep work for a, a client of ours um, and just searching through some of the rich data sets I was maintaining on reconnaissance, uh, December 2015, January 2016, 
uh, we came across uh, some building management systems that should have been facing out to the internet. Um, this then led me to pulling on a few threads and then mapping out a, a whole suite of issues in a couple of building management systems uh, that were all internet facing uh, that did not have effective access control uh, in place uh, at all. So uh, if you really wanted to, you could start interacting with these buildings um, without needing a username or password. Um, that was problematic uh, for about the 50 or 60 odd buildings that we did identify. A lot of them were uh, in uh, were everywhere, but there was actually a heavy concentration of them in Canberra, funnily enough, which uh, Canberra can be very sensitive to some of the systems that they have uh, down there and also some of the buildings that they host as well. So uh, that led us to, to attempting uh, responsible disclosure to uh, the sysintegrator who also uh, had a relationship with the, the vendor that then led to uh, to really nothing getting done over about a hundred day period uh, we were then going to, to publish our disclosure uh, and until such time we got a legal threat so uh, that created a, a lot of issues for us uh, I've also uh, I don't have full clarity on it but the disclosure we put together also uh, made its way up the, the chain throughout uh, Australian government as well. Uh, I understand it was with uh, Prime Minister and Cabinet at one point. Um, it created a, I guess you could say to the points you were talking about on your, your lead in there, of there was a, a lack of clarity and uh, there was uncertainty with what had just happened. Um, and, you know, here I was uh, coming from the internet saying, hey, I'm here to help, let me help. Uh, and things kind of getting blown out of uh, out of uh, out of control for uh, you know, what could have quite easily been fixed, uh, you know, in the months prior to it to turning into a bit of a blowout. Let's talk a little bit about more. I mean, building on the no pun intended, building on the uh, the building uh, management systems theme. Um, SCADA and um, ICS vulnerabilities, I think, are one of the main bugbears, one, one, one of the major bugbears of, of information security organizations. You know, since, since that whole, I wouldn't say sector, that whole area has been both relatively slow to accept vulnerability to, to emerging threats, has been targeted by a lot of threats. I mean, PLC Blaster comes to mind. This story is, you know, all the way back to, to, to Stuxnet. <laughs> which we don't talk about, right? Yeah. Uh, and I think, you know, maybe the medical device community is one of the earlier ones to 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 accept that, that systems which don't meet the classical, you know, software operating system, well, it's all software, but, you know, the, the, the classical system administrator maintained op operating system, Windows, Unix, whatever, uh, right. and, and, and uh, associated patching processes, that these can be not only employed in very, very critical positions, but frequently are not updated sufficiently by the vendors. There's not a lot of visibility and they're kind of out of sight of out of mind of information security management organizations. Where do you see the current state? You know, I'm, I'm, I'm leading into another topic with this, but where do you see the current state of vulnerabilities um, and the trajectory of vendor res and, and, and customer receptiveness to to bug publication discovery in the first place of of such systems whether you know they're, they're network components healthcare management systems aviation control whatever yeah look i think that the thing to be cognizant of with building management systems and you know sky and ics for example is that these are life supporting systems they're not information systems i think you you kind of said we as the infosec community have historically been quite focused on confidentiality, integrity, availability, things of that nature. But when we start looking at operation technology, you know, our focus turns to high availability as well as reliability, safety, and, and our capacity to support life. Uh, and then even longevity, because these systems then need to remain in place for 40 years. A constant patching, for example, over 40 years may not necessarily be sustainable. So how do you have a system where your sustainment is install, leave in place, and revisit a couple of years later. Um, and, and so I think there's there's two thoughts I, I have here. One, yes, they're very vulnerable because of the nature of what they do, and also there's certain functions you need to be able to perform um, that we as InfoSec professionals probably don't think about, even though 
uh, sorry, that we probably start to lay a bit of a burden uh, on our, our counterparts in, in the operational space, but um, uh, but also the you know the risk classification. What you're thinking about is, is completely different, but that's also not really much of an excuse here. And so far, that you know, there's there's still ways to think about security. It's just your considerations are quite different. Um, so you know your dependence on segregation, your dependence on on specific. Uh, access to the network as well as the physical environment itself uh, becomes more critical. So, uh, I think, I think, uh, in answer to your question, um, it's it's a different space. We need to actually conceive it in that different space. Like for me, I always say cybersecurity is the study of context. Um, you know, applying one like method of here is how we deal with problems uh, consistently across the environment. If we could do that, um, many of us would be out of a job. Yeah, it's about the everything has its own challenges. I think there are other things that we were looking at when we were engaging with the building management systems community uh, was um, there's a huge dependence on incumbency, which means that if you've got a, a new innovative solution that can compete, uh, good luck installing it in the next 10 or 20 years, which means that there's no incentive to change it to maintain. Um, but even still, so we found interesting uh Threat scenarios that with an Australian vendor we started mapping over. Okay, the the threat here may not actually be, you know, death and destruction, but economic. Which is, can you, if you have a look at the building management systems infrastructure in Australia, can you economically impact them because they're running on such thin margins? So you know, turn up the air conditioning for ninety days and uh, make your competitor insolvent, for example, or create an insolvency event that allows you to buy out of building stuff like that i think there's more complexity um uh, in terms of understanding risks and threats but then also i guess in terms of a, a research standpoint it's it's still very much hey here's issues what's the framework we need to to solve those issues and uh, you know i, I in, in the con in the con in the context again of your of your, your, your quote about context um I think one 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 of the things that's missing in a lot of companies is even if they have a data asset classification mechanism in place for their overall risk management structure, they're frequently missing the concept of asset accreditation, i.e., a classification mechanism for, for example, infrastructure components as to whether these are competent and secure enough to meet the classification requirements of the data assets they're dealing with. It's a really good point, and I, when you when you mention the the potential for economic damage. Because how would you classify in the terms of an IT risk management structure continued building operation? You know, I guess it's something that for your, I guess you know medical or aviation or industries like defense they will have integrated operational security concerns into their overall systems and data risk management structures. But if you're a trucking company, I guess, or or you know an insurance provider, or I don't know, you know anybody with an office. That's going to be a big challenge. Um, yeah. Build, building building on that. Um, when when you when you found this this issue, did you? What were some of the 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 the, the quotes or yeah, I don't want to say quotes, but what were some of the the let's say misunderstandings or misapprehensions, um, just the wrongness that you encountered on the legal side of things when people were basically telling you, you know, here's a threat, don't do this, bad, bad, bad. You know, we'd rather hide it than, than have it have it published. Look, uh, interesting question. I think the early stages of our disclosure, the, the sense I got from the, the vendor that we were talking to uh, was quite dismissive. And, and to be quite frank, um, Without going into too much detail or identifying the, the vendor, there there was a sense of apathy that had existed within their culture, and, and that's yeah. You know, there's not much we can really do there. Um, quite frankly, they didn't care. Um, they were dismissive of what we found, and that may just be because they didn't quite understand. But that being said, one of their competitors, uh, which was an Australian-based company, uh, were great. They they were awesome to work with. But I'll, I'll talk about those folks later. Um, so I think one cultural apathy uh, was one of the, the factors that had played in here. Um, another one in terms of the legal risks and the lean considerations, um, what had evolved um, 
over time was when we were like, hey, look, we, we are going to be publishing this. Um, the uh, director of the company at the time, uh, you could actually start to, to sense, like he ended up calling me at one point um, and I'm like, hey, yeah, look, I'm here to help. Here's everything uh, that I can um, can provide you. But they then took that as, as, well, he's now just given us the evidence to incriminate him because logically that's what someone's going to do, right? Um, so that then turned into a very litigious uh, approach uh, on their side. However, it, it did become apparent a little bit later there was cause for it because a uh, there were events related to uh, acquisition um, of components within these organizations in 2016 that uh, had we published at the time that we did, um, uh, we would have undermined a, a multi-million dollar deal without intent, of course. Um, and so in, in that case, there was, on their side, there could have very well been an argument for I just cost them X million of dollars uh, in their deal because of what I just published. So... That's yeah. a so that, that's a big one, yeah. Um, the 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 just re, re, with your former point about you know not taking seriously, there was in a previous role, I, I I had this idea of something I called functional programming, which is a nice way of saying basically a subject matter expert, not infosec, with a with a Visual Basic book in one hand and coding on the other hand, trying to make something work. That is not going to necessarily be the person who cares or knows about the security implications of of bad programming or bad design so so maybe not not by way of excuse but rather explanation where that comes from the yeah well, I, I will disagree with you on this I, I think these are cultural norms that get dictated from you know the board level down um, in, in this case I think and I've talked about this as well with uh, another gentleman who actually has now gone into defensive technologies and building management systems where he's like you have some people that are actually Quite all, quite friendly. They care about their jobs. They have passion, and then you just have others that are, if I can use his term, they're a pack of grubs. So we had sorry, sorry, well, you broke up for a second there. A, a pack of grubs. Ah, 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 that's so, abusing. Uh, I, I think that's probably an Australian or an Australian quality. I'm not too sure if that exists around the world, but I think it does now. It does now. <laughs> um, but there are, are cultural norms and cultural attributes that I think. We should be we we unfortunately overlook these um, because we 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 think cybersecurity is a technical problem. It's a mix of things. I think you know this was certainly one of the experiences I had. At it it was a, a very formative lesson for me. Is you know don't think because you're disclosing vulnerabilities and getting a ticket and then hoping the ticket gets processed, everything's going to be fine. There's there's individual attributes and behaviors that need to flow on from that. So. Um, so looking after those and, and um, you know, being mindful and having that emotional intelligence around those, I, I think is quite important. I think it's a common issue with with infosec professionals and to 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 look at what we do at a technical level, whether it's vulnerability disclosure, protective mechanisms, architecture as a technical, purely technical problem, very rational. Whereas you're dealing with, as you as you indicated, with with people, for example, in the business, the quote unquote business side of things, who see it as in a more holistic way, and this is a really important point that you made actually, and I want to underscore that is is the when you're disclosing bugs, it's not just some boomer or Gen X or God, um, who is uh, that's me, who who is saying no, this is bad. I'm just you know I don't want it being being released because I'm irrational and uninformed. But there may actually be context such as as you indicated, financial loss from a disclosure. Yeah. And I think this is this is a a not only is it important at a technical level, I think, to have legal clear legal rules that protect researchers that try to do this responsibly, but to create a framework that that can channel disclosure. To protect everybody's interests, does yeah, yeah, no, de definitely. I think well, it's not only a framework, but it's what gets derived from that framework, that approach. Um, so the the Australian vendor that we did work through, and we found when we were trying to map out and enumerate building management systems, uh, this random Australian vendor came up and said, "Hey, guys, can I help out? You know, I'm, I'm just doing a bit of a poker program. They they gave me a test system in about." A day or two, I found some pretty serious bugs. Um, those bugs got patched 
for all 230 systems of theirs facing out to the internet got patched in a matter of 48 hours um, with no fuss, no legal fees, no problems. But I think second and third order effects of that were they can communicate, hey, we've actually responded to um, to ethical disclosure and to you know someone acting in faith versus the other firm that spent a lot of money on lawyers and they still had vulnerable systems facing out to the internet 12 months down the line. And so I think there's a, a wider piece here um, when we talk about those those attributes and those norms and those frameworks is how do those get used to enable um, trust and confidence in the systems that we're using? Because I, I think there's there's opportunity for that carrot and stick approach there. The, the holy grail of, 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 of cybersecurity investment, you know, right now we're at a point where we're trying to at the same time convince management and leadership to, to meet regulatory mandates, but also to, to engage in constructive risk management in order to make sure that they're just not exposed by, by complying with consistent, you know, rule sets, frameworks, models, whatever of risk management. But the holy grail is really, well, this will help me not only lose money, but make more money. So I hope you'll share this conversation with the guys that did the patching and let them, you know, they, they'll know who they are, may, you know, show as we, we are a trusted company. So as this, however, unfortunately has been a very, very slow process to get organizations to recognize that trust at trustworthiness, um, in the information. So, you know, we take infosec, we take your data, your, your, your CIA, whatever, seriously is a reason why you should do business with us because people are still yeah. giving their data to TikTok and Facebook and whatnot voluntarily, right? And even though I think we've seen a new generation progressively entering leadership levels, as you said, it's not a technical issue so much, or it's not only a technical issue. We've seen new generations entering leadership levels who are more responsive to this, but we still have a lot of inertia. Do you think yeah. that things like cybersecurity certification rules for critical systems, software products, like we're getting in the EU, are going to be a major driver behind accepting the need for at least tolerating, well, even encouraging consistent, responsible vulnerability disclosures by, by companies? Look, I, I hope so. Um, you mentioned certification and, and accreditation of products. Um, you know, the, the one that comes to mind is the IoT Trustmark that's uh, building out here in Australia. I'm, I'm not too sure what's happening in in the EU, but I mean, you know, this is kind of what makes sense: is uh, IoT based systems, uh, you know, are, are suffering from the free market economy, which is let's build things out hard, fast, and cheap, uh, with no consideration to security or, or care. Um, if there is a a certification behind these things to say that yes, this can be trusted and and is valid. I think that's going to to lead to better outcomes uh, for consumers, but also uh, I keep using that term trust and confidence. Um, the the curious thing here in Australia is um, there's been two major cyber events in the last twelve years where it wasn't the technical attack that killed uh, these companies off, but the the lack of trust and the fact that people could no longer confidently use these systems anymore um, uh, or, or cast, you know, stakeholders didn't feel like they could, could engage in it. So creating this ecosystem of, uh, of certification or verification or even responsible disclosure and the follow on processes for responsible disclosure, um, for, for me has a, a significant, uh, economic value attached to it because we can actually clear off some of this whole idea of everything is vulnerable and everything can be hacked. It's like, well, there's a little bit more complexity to it than that. And, and I think that's something we're certainly seeing in, in our professional work nowadays. Um, and, and this is something, honestly, this is something that's absolutely mind blowing to me. And I, yeah, I always just get in fights with one of my former bosses about this, about banks. Banks are not about money. Banks are about data and about trust with a thin layer of cash on top, a lot thinner than we may think, as we're finding out recently again. Um, and over over the years, banks, insurances, you know, I get airlines, healthcare providers, what have you, cars, 
have implicitly marketed trustworthiness. We are quality and using our product at, at the very basic will not kill you or will make your life better to customers. So this whole trustworthiness model is implicit in their, their marketing, their value proposition. Somehow that has not on the whole translated to CIA to providing security to your data. You know, it's, 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 again, people are still voluntarily giving their own information to TikTok and whatnot. And, and very, very few organizations are marketing their, their security to, to, as a, as a, as a, as a selling point to customers, whether, whether institutional or private. And, 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 you know, that, that's why I was asking about the, the certification. It's, 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 it's a legal certification requirement or for, you know, for example, systems vendors that the European Union is proposing that's, that's coming in the next couple of years. And of course, a lot of the American device manufacturers were screaming bloody murder about this a couple of years ago, you know? So, so on one hand, you've now got this growth of, as you mentioned, the IOT trust mark, but also, also a legal requirement that if your device is going to be used in any critical, any part of critical industry as defined by a regulatory framework. Then it has to meet certain certain you know quality criteria in terms of data protection and 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 availability integrity etc. So that's mm. that's kind of for me the 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 question of of whether this you know this this kind of one two punch of or, or one two three punch of you know evolving management maturity, um, industry certification, quality certification, and regulatory requirements will 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 you know increase the openness to a, a legal and consistent, you know, disclosure of vulnerabilities without the kinds of threats that you were facing. Yeah. Yeah. Look, I, I would hope so. I think this comes down to the maturity, right. Of dealing with, um, yeah, dealing with the problems that we have in this world. Um, you know, I, I, I remember having a, a chat with a, um, uh, with a parent on a course I was on and he, he kind of went through this whole thing of uh, his son, you know, came home a bit groggy, a bit everywhere, and it turns out he, he had McDonald's for, uh, for for lunch, which you know might uh, might offend some might offend some of your uh, your, your European listeners. Um, not maybe, no. No. but it, it was okay. <laughs> you know, the, the son wasn't open and honest about. Hey, I had Macca's uh, and couldn't eat dinner, and so he, he kind of just carried on. I think for him it was a case of, well, you know, here at the dining table, we, we would have actually appreciated a, a bit of our honest feedback on this, and that would have actually led to me accommodating for all these problems. I think it comes down to, in his case, his whole piece was open, honest dialogues, both uh, from you know from both parties, would have actually led to a more conducive um you know a lot more conducive household and for him it was just a constant struggle he was having with uh, uh with his son i think the the same analogy can apply to us right it is this is about um about uh you're, you're talking about that engagement in the marketplace of you've got social media providers you've got uh in this case critical infrastructure providers it's about how you provide that confidence that everything's okay and i think we can go on about oh yeah we can do all these phenomenal um, all these phenomenal epic attacks or uh, all these outcomes. I, I think for me what we've just had at home, and I think a conclusion we're drawn to here is is down to this whole trust piece. Um, you know we can we can manage some of these technical risks, but if we as a society cannot uh, have that trust and that confidence, um, you know where are we really and i think things like understanding that we're not here to do dodgy research and could pro quo people accepting vulnerability disclosures will will do the right thing but i think um it, it just gives us a more harmonious and more conducive society to to operate in that's a that's a really profound that's that's a really profound observation i like that kind of creating this it, it that, that we're creating this underlying level of trust through 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 the knowledge that there is indeed a constructive dialogue among all the stakeholders not only a bunch of infosec you know nerds pushing their pushing their wares on a bunch of unsuspecting you know businesses or what have you um i want to i want to just very quickly shift course to 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 one last point i'd like to to get into and that is the jurisprudence in your experience in your knowledge 
let's let's I mean every every country obviously has a different legal and cultural approach to prosecution inve- investigation prosecution and 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 uh, judgments mm-hmm. in Australia as everywhere judges tend to be a little bit older prosecutors tend to be a bit more motivated by getting convictions law enforcement tends to be be motivated by by successful investigations mm-hmm. and I say tends very very clearly you know, because there are very big exceptions and there's obviously an evolution here. What is your experience in terms of attitudes, in terms of culture towards somebody going the prosecutorial route um, and saying, hey, this person is bad because they technically violated a rule, some sort of a computer misuse act or whatever the equivalent is. So we're going to hit them with the full force of the law. Is there more of a pragmatic attitude towards this? Is this evolving or is do you still see a, a long way to go in terms of how the, the 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 criminal part of the legal issue deals with vulnerability research and disclosure? It's so interesting interesting question here. I think if we looked at the cases over in Perth with uh, the TransPerth hack as well as the dumping of pager traffic that uh, all have occurred in the last seven or eight years, um, there was a very prosecutorial approach in the case of, uh, of West Australia and very much a, you know, let's send in the SWAT teams against these pesky hackers, watch out, he's got a logic bomb sort of stuff. So I think for me, there's a a lack of education, a lack of awareness, but I think there's also the other side here. And I think this is going to be really curious uh, in other jurisdictions here in Australia. Um, And certainly the the US, will we actually see product liability becoming a factor in, uh, in these spaces? So if you have not taken reasonable steps to provide a secure piece of software, if that could be demonstrated because you didn't respond to someone's vulnerability disclosure or someone's identification that you've done something or there is a risk associated with the system, will that translate into uh, the opposite where it's not the research or the hacker getting, uh, sorry, it's not the research or the the uh, the person who's just stumbled across a bug that's getting the legal threat, that it's the the uh, the, um, the the vendor or the uh, per- the organisation that's providing service. So I think that was curious to note in uh, the um, uh, the Patrick Webster case here, um, almost ten years ago, where uh, there was initially a, a police response um, uh, for research he did on uh, First State Super. Uh, where he identified a, a, an, a, an insecure direct object referencing vulnerability in his appli- in a an application that was maintaining his uh, uh, his retirement savings account. Um, he had a, a legal threat, legal threat, and also police turned up at his doorstep. Uh, the publication of this risk uh, saw that issue start to go away a little bit, but on top of it, it, it then started to see increased scrutiny against First State Super. Uh, and so I think what we may actually see is, in fact, the opposite effect is prosecutors not going after researchers, but going after companies that have reacted poorly. And I, I think there's also a risk of that going to the other extreme where um, where uh, even when a company demonstrates you know, reasonable behavior, uh, someone still decides to go after them uh, because they've got an axe to grind. So I, I think this is going to be a really curious space um, from a, uh, you know, from how does the law respond to this over the next couple of years? And that's a massive discussion. You know, you mentioned product liability, uh, provider liability. That's been going on since 2000, before that even. And yes. that's a really interesting point. You know, if 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 an organization is informed of 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 a of a um, of a bug. Uh, do they do they or do they not take timely steps to address it if they've been informed in a reasonable manner? So I so that's almost almost taking the 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 legal system out of the picture in terms of motivation and simply simply you know relegating them to to being a, a tool of enforcing the laws as they stand. 
So that's that's a really that's a really interesting approach, and I I would I would also be curious to see how that develops. Um, yeah. With with that, I wanna I wanna wrap up. Being conscious of of it, you know, that's getting very very late in, in Sydney. Um, I want to thank you very much for your time and give you the opportunity. If you want to wrap up with any closing thoughts, whether it's recommendations for researchers for for industry, um, whomever, and you know, based on your experience, how should we go about this? You, you've you've made a lot of very very um, good observations in in this talk, and I'm going to you know also link to a lot of the the references that you made in in the video description. But if you want to uh, close out on your end and give some some whatever wise wise uh, thoughts to the audience i so there's a, a quote i've actually been using a, a lot from uh, samuel jackson uh pulp fiction when we've been engaged with a lot of customers recently it's you know hey everybody be cool i think there's there's something that i think we need to be cognizant of both from a, a researcher standpoint but also from the, the recipient of vulnerability disclosures and just more broadly, our, our stakeholders. Um, I think everyone's trying to do their best. Uh, everyone's trying to engage properly. I think sometimes cybersecurity conjures up these Augustinian views of good and evil, and uh, everyone's suddenly an ethical hacker because they like to impose their own ethical views on the world. Um, I think we need to to sort of recognise that um, we're all human and. And I think there's approaches that we can employ here to, to ensure that uh, we can all leave this world a little bit better than we found it. I like that. And I, I was I was about to say, when you said Samuel Jackson quotes, I um, a few other ones came to mind from my own background in this industry, but we all, we all know which ones those are. Um, so with that said, I, 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 again, I want to thank you very, very much for taking the time for staying up late for us. Um, I wish you all the best of luck and success, and uh, I will be linking, if it's okay with you, to your LinkedIn profile, to your 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 company page, uh, to um, sorry Mercury Information Security Services. I make no apologies for having an absolute boiled cabbage's memory of names and 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 faces. Um, My and um, please, uh, for the rest of you, please uh, make sure to check out our other videos on the topic. Visit us at uh, gfcrc.org. And check out also our, our own LinkedIn page, which I'll link to. And I wish everybody a, a safe and 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 secure and and relaxing because you know where your vulnerabilities are and you're fixed them already. Uh, afternoon, evening, morning, whatever. And uh, see you on the next one. Thanks, folks. Thanks, Edward. Bye-bye.